Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming out. I was told we're going to be introed. Uh, hey, Roy Wood Jr. Oh, okay. I won't talk. Most of you know that this is our third Politicon. The very first Politicon, uh, we had about 138 tickets sold with two weeks to go. And then we announced that uh, Roy works with uh, Trevor Noah. We announced that Trevor Noah was going to come. And Trevor came and he was, uh, did stand up and was interviewed by James Carville. And we ended up with about 3,000 people. Last year we had several thousand. And this year we're going to have about 10,000 people. So I want to thank everybody for coming to this event. Now, uh, Adam, first of all, thank you, Adam. This is your first time here? Yes, it is. So thank you for doing this. Oh, Adam, I've been in Pasadena twice, but it's my first Pasadena Politica. <laughs> uh, well, on Twitter today, one of our guests tomorrow said, I can't wait to come to Politicon in Long Beach. So that was Anna Navarro, and you can give her a hard time when you see her tomorrow. Uh, so Adam, you have a podcast for about eight years? Yeah, well, eight plus. And yeah. my understanding is that this is the most listened to or downloaded podcast in the world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you, Guinness Book of World Records. That's pretty great. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Adam and Roy. Roy, I'm going to give you this microphone. Thank you. Thank you. How you uh, doing, man? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, f frazzled. I, I, I was in Detroit this morning, and... Uh, I don't know why I like saying that in front of black people, but uh, I feel like I feel like it's some it's 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 better you know, than I Seattle. I saw some of your right? people this morning. I was in Detroit this morning, and uh, I flew out, and I landed at uh, LAX at 5:30, and I just came straight here. So I apologize for being late. Um, wh where'd you come from, and when did you get here? Uh, I was in New York this morning. No, I was in New York yesterday, and then I came to town, and I went to In-N-Out Burger like the fat bastard I am. Because it's delicious. And then I just did a weed panel where we were talking about the legalization of marijuana. Uh, Roger Stone was on it. It's a very interesting, charismatic dude. He's on, he wants weed legalized. I, I want everything legalized because uh, <laughs> I, I was talking, we had a guest on our show that was embedded with, you know, drug guys and this, that, and the other. And he just basically said, there's nothing we can do to stop any of this. Like, it's just, it's gonna come over the border. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, what happened with the Mexican drug cartels is they were all selling weed and then we legalized weed in a lot of places. So they switched over to heroin and now everyone's on heroin. So my thing is, just, let's just legalize everything, including prostitution while we're at it. I, okay, and just put it all at Walgreens and you just, just whenever you it, want it. Just put it all in front of the counter or on the counter at the Walgreens. <laughs> I'm not so emphatic about legalizing prostitution in front of my wife. I start with the weed and then I go to the drugs and then I eventually <laughs> get to prostitution and I go, you know, for those guys. <laughs> but I, 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 all consensual stuff, all, all, all crimes that don't involve uh, violence and, and m most things that are just sort of between, look, you want to do drugs, you want to get a blow job, you got 50 bucks, whatever it is, I, I, I'm, I'm open to it. So a drug for blow job barter system. Yes. Yes. And I'm, okay. I'm trying not to uh, create the, uh, the black markets. Um, so, sorry. Uh, I want to talk about you for a second, because I know you started doing morning radio. Yeah, that's where I started. And I know you got, uh, I think I was reading about you on the way in, like uh, morning, he got, Roy got like a, an award for uh, one of the best morning radio shows in a major market. Yeah, in the state of Alabama. I had the best morning show in the state of Alabama, which, I mean, rank that where you want it. But in Alabama, I was the shit. I want to talk about timing and, and your sort of rhythms of life for a second. And you tell me how this works. Because and I, I, I'm interested in what all you have to say, except for none of you fucking talk. Okay. <laughs> but we, we, when you do comedy, you do comedy at night. 
comedy, like stand-up comedy is a 10 o'clock gig. It's not even a 6.30 or 7 o'clock gig. It's a 10, 11, 12 o'clock gig. And it's like, I always tell people all the time, it's like, you know, brisket, brandy, uh, eating pussy, all these things, they're good, but they're kind of nighttime activities. You know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't like them at 7.45 in the morning. I've, I've had some leftover pussy in the morning. <laughs> leftover right. pizza pussy is good, like cold <laughs> pizza pussy is, is good. But yeah, I, you don't want, you know, you, you don't want a brandy snifter and, and brisket and pussy at eight, but it's, it's un, but at 10 o'clock at night, it's unbelievable. It's prime time. Right, it's prime time. And I, I say the same thing about comedy. And so whenever I talk to someone who does morning radio, doing comedy at 5.45 in the morning, basically eating pussy and eating brisket and drinking brandy every morning at 5.45 in the morning, it's tough because it's not the witching hour for comedy. Yeah, it's, it's a different context because you can't do late night humor. That's the other thing with radio is that you have to be clean, especially for broadcast. Like this wasn't like an internet radio show, so you have all of the rules and you can't disrespect the sponsors. So what I found to be is that morning radio isn't so much about a punchline as much as it is just energy and intention. Like most radio shows, there's a lot of laughter and banter and it's just, hey, what are you doing? I'm doing this and we're doing it. Hey, we're doing it and let's play some usher. Yeah. Like it's that type of, that, that was the cheap trick that I could use that at night, there's only so long you can stay on stage and bullshit people with, hey, what's going on? How you get before you have to tell a real joke? Yeah, I think we've both been doing that for about the last 15 minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> so one of us is gonna have to tell a real joke at some point. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know last time you saw Zach Galifianakis, but I just got off an airplane with Zach Galifianakis, right. who has done the one-two punch of I don't recognize you lost a hundred pounds and shaved his beard. Had no idea who- You didn't it, meet Zach Galifianakis who, then. <laughs> he said he was Zach Galifianakis. Nah. <laughs> he did ask to borrow money. Maybe you're right. He wanted Jimmy's home address and he wanted to borrow money. <laughs> and he said he was Zach Galifianakis, so it was cool. hundred pounds? I, I, I don't know. You guys look it up. He, he, I could not recognize him on the uh, flight I just got off of from uh, Detroit, brother. Okay. <laughs> uh, I uh, also, I had this going through the Detroit uh, airport. And I don't, I don't know if you, I, I, I had this times too. I don't know if you guys... Have, have quite uh, wrapped your heads around this, but I always thought when I was an adult, many problems would go away. Like when I was a kid, I just thought, well, if I'm an adult, people will stop treating me like shit. Mm -hmm. no, no can do. I had, uh, I had this happen to me at the, uh, at the Dearborn Inn in Detroit today, which is, and I don't know why, but now that I'm older, it irks me that this is being done to me by 23 and 24 year old dudes. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. so the guy behind the counter at the Dearborn Inn, I said to the guy, um, hey, can I get a late checkout? This checkout thing is such a scam, right? You got to be checked out by noon. The next couple's coming in at 3 p.m. The Guatemalan bitch takes nine <laughs> minutes to make up the room. Why the three-hour window? And then how come when you ask for a two-hour window for her to come in and shake the jizz off the sheets, they start shaking their head like, uh, I don't know, I don't know if we're gonna make it. Like, it shouldn't take that long to do that, right? But, but they give her the whole floor, so she they, needs that time. All right, but I asked for a late checkout and I got, uh, hold on a second, I'm convinced, by the way, the computer keyboard's not even hooked up to anything. They have one they, they, have one they use when they just want to say, no, hold on a second. Clack, 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 clack. Just to give it authenticity, they stop in the middle, and they look up, they go back down again. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, no. I know it's not hooked up. I know there's nothing on the screen, but they're just tap, tap, tapping away. 
Uh, yeah, somebody else has the room at three, so we're going to have to pretty much keep you. It's going to have to be noon. No late checkouts. And then I said to the 26-year-old guy who makes $13 an hour, I said, how about you give me until 1230? And he said, okay, but, and then he repeated exactly what he said 18 seconds earlier, which is, we have another couple coming in. They needed it three. I, I was being talked to. Was this like a suite or something? Was no, that like a very specific No, this is just room? a regular room. The point is, is I had a guy who makes $13 an hour talking to me like I had a learning disability, and I was asking, I was selling him candles on the street, you know? <laughs> like, he was like, okay, 1230, but listen, little Timmy. There is another couple of adults coming here at 3, <laughs> and 12.30 means 12.30. Do you promise? Yes, do you promise? And we did a pinky, <laughs> we did a pinky swear. Then, when I was going through security at the airport, I got this one. Uh, the guy said, uh, I did the move where I, I took my watch off. Mm -hmm. And I was putting my watch in the doggy bowl that goes through the x-ray. <laughs> and I took the watch off, and the guy, again, the guy was like 22, he said, oh, you don't have to put it through the doggy bowl. You can just, you can go through security. You can go through the thing that gives you testicular cancer with, with the watch. And I said, oh, okay. And then he said, but you got to put it on. It's just good science, right? That's how... You can't just hold it? I was holding it. He said, no, put it on. Why? If you say why, you'll be pepper sprayed before <laughs> you get to the end of asking why. So I'm standing there like trying to... Don't ever try to put your watch on in a hurry. It never really works. No. So I'm trying to get my watch on and the chick is waving me through, like come through. And the guy's yelling at me, put the watch on. And I just had it in my hand. I was like, oh, I'm going through. Now the waving chick, she doesn't know about the watch conversation no, she that's doesn't. happening. And then this one, it set off the uh, pinball machine. It went to tilt when I walked through the thing. And I literally, I literally did this. She went, I walked through the thing and the thing just went off like a pinball machine, like started making all kinds of noise. And I stopped and she said, you set the bell off. And I said, yeah, I know. She said, turn around and come through again. And I turned around and I started walking this way and she goes, turn around and come through again. Like she yelled at me again yeah. as I was walking through the thing to turn around and come again. And here's all I'm saying. I don't know if anyone here works security, but like I was at the Burbank airport and the guy said, uh, turn around, because he wanted to do the wand thing on me. And I started to turn around. And as I was turning around, he said, real quick. You're but, not rotating fast enough? Right. In another two-tenths of a second, I would have been fully around. And by the way, if I did go like this, he would tackle me, yeah. pepper spray That's me, and zip, zip tie me. Yeah. I know. So... Well, let me fix one of your problems. Thank you. Never check out of a hotel. Oh. You never check out of a hotel. What do you do? Well, what do you, what you do is just stay. Like you Howard have, you Hughes. You have two options. You have two options. Throw the latch on the door, go downstairs, formally check out so that your credit card is closed out of the system. For them to charge you again, you have to present your credit card. Uh -huh. So you go back up to your room at like 1130, and you just fucking kick it till 2.45. <laughs> and there's nothing they can do. It, because keep, here's where you have the advantage. You, you, you lose the advantage. The young kids, millennials have the advantage on policy. Mm -hmm. Because the rule is this. I can enforce the rule. You need to know the rule. But if you are in a confrontation, mm -hmm. you're a grown motherfucking man, bro. And he's right. not going to challenge so just you. Do it that and way. he's not going to come up to the room and knock and tell you you got to leave. And the Guatemalan lady, maybe she doesn't know enough English to know how to kick you out the room. So you're just in a really good position of power where you just stay. I'm going to do that 20 years of road time. comedy. I'm telling you, bro, just stay in the room. And I'm a black dude, and I do it. So you, you know it's safe for you to do. I, I, can't, uh, 
I don't know if you guys are like me, but somehow the $5 water in the room, I'll never make enough money to grant myself the privilege to bust the hymen on that $5 water. I don't care how fucking rich I am. I will be at shit, like, at events earlier that night and they'll have the bottled water and I'll be like, oh yeah, I gotta fill up this other bottle and I'll put one in my pocket and I'll fill my ass crack and my earlobes with it and I'll mule it back up to the room because I cannot <laughs> bust that thing. I had the, 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 the tube of water with the silver big round thing on it. Are you guys good enough? Like who, who has evolved enough to just go to that mini bar and get it King size Snickers bar, or get that five dollar water, and have no thoughts about it. You are One no thoughts in here. You just go fuck it. I'm rich. It's yeah. five bucks. I don't give a shit. I'm doing it. I my my past, my my childhood, my stupid dad yelling at me like <laughs> your, your dad handing. You don't flash back to 1977, and your dad's giving you a quarter for the ice cream truck. Going, this is a lot of money. This is a lot of money. Do not waste it. Now you just you just with with impunity, freedom and panache just walk right just you just sashay right over to that water bottle, just bust it open, drink it. Who amongst us then could actually leave water in that bottle? Cuz that's I can't. That's undoable. That's undoable for me. I will bring it to the airport. I will get, I, I'm convinced there's going to be a syndrome called floating liver, where everyone is just standing with their $5 <laughs> bottle of water in front of the security line, and they're going, you can't bring it. And I'll, I'll sit there and chug that. I bring a funnel. I'll have a buddy dumping it in my ass. I will not, I cannot throw that away once I've spent $5 have you, have for it. Have you ever just looked in the trash can of stuff that TSA has taken? Yes. It's just a track, like a 30 gallon trash can just full of just half drunk waters. But that's that's my thing. This let's just say it's nitroglycerin and I'm the new face of Al Qaeda. <laughs> Don't we then just have a trash can filled with half bottles of nitroglycerin in the middle of a serpentine line that never ends? Like Aren't we just going to take the entire staff of the airport, the TSA, and everybody waiting in line? Like, there's no greater population of human beings than around that trash can. There's 700 civilians just standing around that <laughs> trash can, like, like, like hobos in Rocky, you know, with the fire. Take it back, do 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 do. Take it back. Yeah, you'll take out more people with that one trash can, right? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, well, what do we... All right, sorry. The trick to the $5 water, refill the bottle and put it back. But how do we get the hymen glued back They don't in check place? it. They, they don't check seal. it. It's housekeeping. They're just looking to see that shit is where it's supposed to be. So they see a full bottle, they just assume nobody touched it. Yeah, but they're getting they're getting it's 50-50. It's not a foolproof. They're getting smart method. now because they have the they have the mini bar where you lift the thing up and and a sensor goes off and somebody downstairs is alerted and <laughs> there's someone in the middle of Cheyenne Mountain and it's Defcon 5, a Corolla's got a <laughs> Can I tell you how committed I am to this? So way back in the day Kevin and Bean We'd all go out with Kevin and Bean and Jimmy Kimmel and everyone. We'd go to New York for the MTV Awards every year uh, and we'd stay there for a week. And you think bottled water's expensive in, in rooms. You should try buying porn in these rooms because that's really expensive, but it's much more essential when you're like 28 and single. And we would not buy the porn, but Jimmy Kimmel figured out that if we brought needle nose pliers and a universal remote, way back in the day, we could get the coaxial. The coaxial had a weird little- Security collar. Yeah. It's a secure anti-theft security collar so that you can't get in there to screw the coaxial off of the, right. the TV. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, Don't this, ask me how I know. Yeah. That. 
This is. <laughs> I know what guy. Jimmy would bring. It would bring needle nose pliers. You could get yeah. back there. You could undo the coax and jump it <laughs> over to the next box. But then the problem was the TV was cut off at like channel 100. But if we brought our universal remote and programmed it, <laughs> we could get all the porno channels. The problem was <laughs> Jimmy was like on the 28th floor and I was like on the 13th floor. And where we only had one universal remote. <laughs> so once you'd put it on the porn channel, then Jimmy would want the universal remote, but you'd just be living with Ron Jeremy 24 <laughs> seven. And it's, it, it's kind of be careful what you ask for. Because when you're done with the porn channel, you're really done with the porn <laughs> channel, big time done with it. And if you switched it, now you could be brazen and just grab the old remote and switch it to channel seven and watch the news, but then you couldn't get back to the porn yeah, you're channel. Done. You're locked that up. would haunt your ass. Because later on, you'd have a hankering. And then you'd have to go back up to Jimmy's room and get the universal remote to get back to the porn channel. So you're basically, like, you have to, like, hey, man, I need to jack off. Let me get the remote. Like, that's basically what you're asking. You, you're basically letting him in the, uh, in the world, though. <laughs> that was, well, that was the funniest. Is that, is that, does that carry the same shame as asking the front desk for more toilet tissue? Yeah, it's up there. It's up there. Like, yeah, I'm running low on lube, and uh, I need new belly bib. Uh, no, that was, uh, that was the, um, one of the great uh, Jimmy Beatoff stories of all time was uh, we were sharing a room outside of Seattle when we went there for the Final Four. When UCLA went to the Final Four in Seattle, the Superdome, or King Dome? Yeah, King Dome, King Dome. at the time. Uh, went there in 1994. We went there, too, and we're staying in a little motel in the, the radio station. You know radio station. They have no budget, cheap, no money, cheap. no nothing. We stayed in the same room at a motor lodge, me and Jimmy, and the, the, it was a bad little, little shower situation we had there. And what happened was is um, I went... Jimmy went in the morning, so we'd have to do the morning show, and we'd have to get up at like 4.45, and I'm not a shower guy, but I was so <laughs> hung over from being at the strip club at 2 a.m. and wanted to get the glitter off me and uh, kind of shake the cobwebs out that I was taking a shower, but Jimmy took a shower first. So Jimmy went in, took a shower, Jimmy got out of the shower, I jumped in, and it was such a shitty little motel that when I stepped in, the water was up to my knees in the bathtub. It was like mid, mid shin, because it, it didn't drain. The bathtub oh. didn't drain, and Jimmy was taking a shower. <laughs> and I got in there, and I started taking my shower. And after about two minutes, there was a big knock on the door. And I said, yeah, what, what's that? And it was Jimmy. And he said, hey, uh, just a heads up, I beat off in there. <laughs> and I was like, now he could have no. been kidding. I don't know. I don't know to this day. I don't want to know. You to stood this day. in Jimmy Kimmel Jizz Water. I stood in Jimmy Kimmel Jizz Water. Yeah. Yeah. That's friendship. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So I just got back from uh, Washington, D.C. So I went to, I went to, it was, it was weird. I, I, went, I went to Washington, D.C. to testify in front of Congress about free speech. It's, stu it's insane. I, d I don't know. Thank you. I have no idea what I was doing, but I was in Washington, D.C., yeah. and then I, then I went to Detroit. But I, 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 I still, to this day, don't know why I did this or why I was asked to do it. But what, what aspects of it? Did you, walk, walk me through exactly what you were testifying for. Let me understand that first. I don't know. I still don't know, but they called you. Like, how do how do you get the how do you get the call to Washington to testify? I just I, it's it's the same way I got to uh, be on Dancing with the Stars, which is it's, I just get a phone call. They go, "You want to do it?" And I go, "Yeah, why not?" Uh, but I was back. I don't know if you were a horrible student in junior high and high school. Yeah. I was a horrible student in junior high and high school, and it is so weird that you cannot rid yourself 
of that, like that horrible student gene stays with you your entire goddamn life. I'm testifying in front of Congress. I am aware of this two weeks ago. And I know I have five minutes to speak. And it's not going to be a conversation. You know, it's going to be, hey, buddy, what's going on? Hey, who's that? Is that your girlfriend over there? Like, it's, it's not going to be crowd work. It's going to be a straight five minutes. It's that C-SPAN shit where you're at the table with the water. C-SPAN, stand up, swear, swear <laughs> yourself in. The whole big, big pictures, a huge oil paintings of old white guys, like all over, all looking at you. And you're just a lot of mahogany, a lot of raised paneling, a lot of nice woodwork, beautiful blue carpet, blue carpet everywhere. The, that's the first thing you notice when you go to Washington is the carpet and the woodwork, like amazing woodwork and amazing carpet. And you're sitting there, and I had two weeks to prepare. I did nothing, <laughs> nothing, but I said, I got a five-hour flight. To DC. So during that five hour flight, I will get my shit together. I got drunk and fell asleep on the airplane, did <laughs> fucking nothing. No prep. And then, if you want to hear what a horrible student I am, I did this move. It was me, uh, a Harvard like law professor, another woman who's like with the uh, NYU law. Uh, ben Shapiro, a sort of, uh, he, he's, uh, yeah, a, a conservative pundit. And I mean, and as soon as I got there, tell me if this isn't horrible student mode. I was like, who's going first? I don't want to go first. I, I want to. It's group because work I'm all gonna, over again. If these two dudes go first, I can buy myself eight or nine minutes to kind of fake my <laughs> shit together. We sit down at this big mahogany table with the microphones and the, your name plates and the pictures and the timers and the whole Congress and the speaker and everyone. And we sit down there. I look to my right. Ben Shapiro has six typewritten pages in bold, no spaces, all caps, <laughs> numbered. Just He's just sitting there. He's, he's locked and loaded and ready to go. The chick from NYU Law, she has her papers all filed. I have a steno pad <laughs> with a couple of things and then arrows going down. Like, no, don't, yeah, talk about this, but then go down, Move. arrow, and then arrow, arrow back here. And I'm, look, I'm sitting there, and everyone has six typewritten pages that they are <laughs> absolutely ready just to, boom, they're going to plow right through it. And I'm just sitting there in the middle. And all I could think of was they give you a notepad that has the official seal on it. And I was like, do I get to take this shit home? <laughs> That's your only thought. Well, my, my only, well, first thought I had was, shit, I should have prepared something on the airplane. And then my next thought was, eh, it always turns out pretty good. And then my next thought was, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Then my next thought was, but maybe this time it will turn out good. And then my next thought was like, God, you're, you're taking this shitty student stuff to the grave. Like Your Ben Shapiro's habits. a good student. He's taking that to the grave. You're a shit student. You're taking that to the grave. And you can't even give him shit at recess for making you look bad. No, no, I couldn't pull his yarmulke back and snap <laughs> it, you know, like a jock strap or... Couldn't give my yarmulke wedgie or anything. You think you're cool because you knew all the answers, nerd? <laughs> yeah. I was intrigued by the weird, I, I, a couple things, the weird uh, hair clips they use to keep it on. And also, I don't know if you're like me, but if your hair is black, you shouldn't be able to wear a black yarmulke. It really can't be seen from more than five feet away. <laughs> you need something Caltrans orange or something with a bullseye on it. Or something that's funny, like it has a big tarantula or something, you know. Something. That's why black people do rags come in a lot of colors. Oh, do they? I, yeah, I, I'm just, this is a theory. I'm not sure. What is, what do, uh, pardon the pun, but what does one do with a do rag? A do rag is, it's a hair tie. It helps to lay your hair down, to style your hair. But well, what, I, 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 like, I get like it. a head wrap, but just for black but, hair. But, like, I got, like, back in the jerry curl days, 
when guys would have to put the plastic shower caps on so they yeah. wouldn't destroy their pillows? Keep the moisture in. Right. That I got. But the do-rag, is that the end look? Or is that on the way look? Well, it depends. I mean, some people wear it because they're banging, and other people wear Like, some people are gang bangers and they wear a do-rag because it's a, it's a thug look. And then there's other people that wear a do-rag because they legitimately have hair that does not fucking obey a comb. Uh-huh. So the do-rag helps to lay the hair down so that the hair grows in the pattern that you want it to grow in. Black people, fact, you should have learned that in Detroit. While you I, was I, I, <laughs> I tried. Detroit is a weird place because Detroit is like one minute you're at the Ford testing facility and the next minute you turn the corner yeah. and uh, you're, you're hanging out on that street where they did uh, Moonlight. Is that the movie? That was in Miami. I think. I think that was. I'm just saying. Yeah. A lot of do rags. Yeah. It's. It's. <laughs> yeah. But speaking the, 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 of do's, yeah. I think our hair is almost exactly the same. Yeah. I'm pretty coarse. I don't um, feel like there'd be a lot. Of, I don't. I don't feel like there's anything you could do with that that I couldn't do with this. I'm starting to gray. Let me ask you a question about graying. Is it natural to have like just three aggressive gray hairs? <laughs> that lead the charge. <laughs> Cause like I, like, I didn't like gradually, like it's just like four gray hairs and they go, this is how it's gonna go down, motherfucker. We're here and six more of my friends are coming every fucking week. <laughs> and if you cut me, I'm gonna grow back thicker and longer. And so I don't know how to. Well, the, yeah, the thing that's weird about the gray hair is it's not only a gray hair and no one wants to see a gray hair, but it comes shooting out like a mattress spring. It's yeah. coarse, it's defiant, it won't go away. You can't hold it down, it pops back up again. Yeah, and that's why I need a do-rag so that this oh, motherfucker lay his ass down at night. Yeah, I, I'd like to wear one, but I feel like it'd be culturally insensitive, Yeah, especially I'm, in the climate that's going on today. Yeah, I'm sure black Twitter are would you, get you. Are you, but I will say this, as a black man, you can dye your hair 20 minutes after you're dead and no one says shit. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's like David Allen Greer is 62 years old. His, he'll do his hair jet black, it looks perfect. Mm -hmm. When Whitey tries that, it does, we don't pull it off. <laughs> we look like Phil Spector. Like it doesn't. <laughs> You see, you see the white. I, I was, I, I spent this weekend with the dude that, the white dude that had the jet black, seventy-two-year-old guy with the jet black hair and beard, and he ends up just looking like a Wooly Willy, like somebody <laughs> took the, the iron chips and, and magnetized his chin. I think the trick is with hair to decide. I think, I think all races, I think like somewhere in your forties, you just got to decide what this shit going to be for the next 30 years. Yeah. But I'm saying commit if you're, to that if right you're, then, if you're Louis Farrakhan, just keep going with it because his hair is black and he looks fine. Yeah, exactly. Because we don't, you'll never know when he started graying. Cause when those first four came in, he went schlop. Right. Don't you guys think I see my thing with the hair is your hair can look women, women and men. Your hair can look 10 to 15 years younger than you, but it shouldn't look 40 years y younger than you. <laughs> that, this is my Paul McCartney theory. Like, Paul McCartney, you're 74 years old. You're telling me not just a little gray around the temple? Like, no. we, all, we were all born. You guys, were, you guys had number one hits when we were born, and you're telling everyone in your band is dead, and you're not going to let a little... <laughs> Just by the way, you're you're Paul McCartney. You don't think you're gonna get your dick sucked if there's like a little, <laughs> just a little gray, just a little creeping in. Yeah. Like at what point do you <laughs> just let it creep in? That's all I'm saying. No, he wants to stay young. He stays young by playing hits and sold out arenas all fucking night and <laughs> banging chicks that are 50 years his, his junior. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, black guys can just change it up. Like Quincy Jones can have like the, I tried to shave my hair, but there's still a couple grays coming yes. in and he's still Quincy Jones. Oh God, you want to talk about a guy quietly gets a ton of hot pussy? Quincy Jones, that guy, 
has been with some spectacular. How do you have this insider information? Just... Look that shit up. I'm telling you. <laughs> smart. All right. Oh, speaking of smart, let me tell you about uh, Smart Mouth. Oh, everyone wants a live read. Dual solution oral rinse. Only activated mouthwash clinically proven to instantly eliminate bad breath and prevent it from coming back for 12 full hours. If I had packed my Smart Mouth, I could have had a shot of it in Detroit at the hotel before the late checkout, and I would still be minty fresh right now at this moment. I could come, we, we could make out right now, and you would <laughs> thank me and probably tip me. Zinc ion technology binds the bacteria, forcing it to stop producing sulfur gas. Nothing ruins an intimate moment as quick as stinky breath. So let's get some Smart Mouth. Get it at smartmouth.com. You find it at Walmart, Target, Walgreens, CVS, wherever you shop. Smart Mouth, yeah. <laughs> Roy, I know uh, you got some dates uh, coming up. How much, uh, how much stand up? Now, how, how busy does the Daily Show keep you? And then how often can you do stand up? And how do, you, how do you balance that? Before the Daily Show, I was on the road probably 14 to 20 days a month just at comedy clubs. Right. And now. I'm probably five to six days a month. There's not a lot of time. So I still get out when I can because at the end of the day, comedy is, in my brain, that's still the bread and butter. That's still the one thing I know. That's the one thing I can control. So I don't ever want to get too far away from it. You ever see a guy that hasn't done stand-up for like, say, I don't know, 10, 20 years, and then you see him slowly starting to come back, and I don't ever want to have to relearn that muscle because it's too hard. Yeah, it's like uh, you had a stroke and you have to learn to walk again. Literally, yeah. And it's going to be tough sledding, and it's like something you have to constantly do. Otherwise, it's like you slipped in the bathtub, broke your hip, and you're an old <laughs> person, and you're out of commission. But what, what is a, a day at the Daily Show like for you? Uh, for me as a correspondent, it's a little different because we have a bit of a different responsibility from the writers, but a day in the show, like I'll give you, let's just say Thursday. So we start with a morning meeting and uh, the executive producers, Trevor Noah and all of the writers, there's probably about 15 people on our writing staff. We all gather in like a little conference room. We've got a couple TVs thrown up and our research department who comb through all the morning news clips. They get there at 7, the morning meetings at 9.30. Uh, they go through everything from the night before. They go through everything in the morning. People come in with their own ideas. They show clips. Everybody just cracks on the clips. Like, the only thing I can compare it to, it's like a, like, you know how you just shoot the shit with your buddies watching TV and you just talk shit about the stuff that's going on on TV and everybody just cracks jokes? There's a person in the corner transcribing everything and by the end of the meeting in an hour, we have an idea of what we want to talk about today. Like, okay, today we're going to talk about Sessions' interview um, on Fox News. And Sessions said he didn't like feeling being called beleaguered. So you you three go right so about Sessions. So they'll literally run the clips. People will start cracking wise, and somebody will be Correct. keeping track of the crack. Like a court reporter. Like right. Stenographer. stenographer. Yeah. yeah. So there's somebody just, any joke that's spit in the room, somebody's clacking that down and it's just a big group effort and everybody I, just talks shit. And I feel like stenographers should be fatter. <laughs> you know what I mean? All they do all day is sit in air conditioning and but move their fingers. It's not is really... This calories, right? It, yeah, it's not How like... How many calories is this? No, that's one of the things I was thinking about when I was addressing Congress is I was looking at the stenographer going, why aren't you fatter? In my head. <laughs> I didn't say anything. She was chunky, but not morbidly obese. Like, I wanted her to be huge. You know what I mean? They still have to walk and leave the building. They... I, I just feel like it's 2017, and stenographers should be fatter. That's just me. So then that's, what about... in a, that's in a perfect world. So when you see a skinny toll booth operator... Yeah, I don't then... like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you why, because it really bumps you in the movies, because in the movies, that, that, that part could be played by Jennifer Aniston, and then it fucks you up. You see what I'm saying? Like they'll take hot chicks and put them in stenographer jobs, but... In real okay. life. Yeah, I probably shouldn't go any further, but I should tell you this. 
It's funny because you're talking about <clears throat> the writers, and I was uh, talking about my theme about being a, a horrible student. One of my other horrible student moves would be <clears throat> when, when I was a writer for Jimmy Kimmel, I think I spent about a year just on the writing staff when, when he first started up the show, and it was the same thing. It was like 12, 14 guys, and you'd have to, a little bit different layout. You'd have to read the newspaper, watch the news, come up with a bunch of stuff, and then at noon, we'd all meet around a big table and go over what's in the news, pitch stories. Correct. Pitch ideas, pitch jokes. Of course, I would show up at noon with nothing, but if 13 dudes went before me, <laughs> I just steal, I wouldn't steal their jokes, I just steal all of their stories. Like they'll go, hey, here's the uh, 10 year anniversary of Princess Die uh, in the car crash. And I'd be like, oh yeah, sure, it's a 10th year. And then I'd come up with some pride. I'd go, oh, uh, let, me, let me expound on that. So I would just go last, but I think Jimmy would start catching on to what I was doing. <laughs> and if I ever had to go first, I had nothing on the fucking page but my own drool. There was nothing there. Now, when you're pitching, though, are other people kind of tagging and going, oh, that's funny, we could approach it from this angle, or is it just you on an island by yourself going, this is what I want to talk about, and I really hope that you like it, Jimmy? I, I would do it. I would jump onto other people's stuff, and the only thing I really remembered is it was all about the food. It was the food would show up and it was free food and whatever the part of me that doesn't want to buy the $5 water at the Dearborn Inn, well, the exact same part of me kicks in with free food. It's like, I can't get over free food. And I loved it, except for Bill, the sports guy, Simmons, yeah. ruined it for everybody because at some point he looked up at Jimmy and the best day of the week was the Chinese food day. Because Italian was fine, and Mexican was fine, and deli was fine, but the Chinese food is meant to be eaten that way. You know what I mean? You know, All the different yeah. trays. The, you get the bed going, you set the table with the rice. You get the bed of rice, and then you do the sweet and sour, but you swear you're gonna go heavy on the veggies and light on the sweet and sour, but you do. don't. You don't, you just slop it on, a couple yeah. little snow peas in there, and whatever. But at some point, Bill Simmons said to Jimmy at the table, after we all ate Chinese food, he's like, Jimmy, no more Chinese food. It's not funny. And Jimmy like looked at him and he went, what? And he went, everyone gets too sleepy. It's got too much MSG. Nobody's funny with Chinese food. And Jimmy went like, all right, no more Chinese food. Oh, and I was like, no. what? What the fuck? No. But don't listen to Bill Simmons. <laughs> the fuck he know about Chinese food making you an unfunny. Chinese people are hilarious. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> ah, I didn't really have a comeback. It's one of the funniest nations. And that was in the, it. No yeah, more Chinese. That was the end. We were never allowed oh, to eat Chinese food ever again because one asshole raised his hand and announced that Chinese food made you unfunny, which is racist. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do not kid yourself. And we never had Chinese food. And from that day on, it was always just cold um, falafel balls. How falafel balls start out great, but once they go cold, it's like eating. It's like a McDonald's fry. It's got to be yes. fresh. It, it literally turns into something else. <laughs> what I mean is like pizza gets cold, you know, salmon gets cold. It's still pizza. It's still salmon. A McDonald's fry and a falafel ball turn into something else, not <laughs> what they were, right? Yes, I agree. McDonald's fries turn into hash browns. But I like hash yeah, browns, and I don't like McDonald's fries when they go know. cold. Hash browns feel like old French fries sometimes if they're not done right. What do you do to bring the shit back to life? I microwave shit. My wife puts everything in the toaster oven because she says that's the way to do it. But I, my self-esteem is too low, and I'm too lazy to fire up the toaster oven. And plus, there's always a little controversy with the foil. We're not sure where the foil is. I believe all fried foods are just done 
either you eat it when it was prepared or it'll just never taste the same. However, I have figured out a way to revitalize a red lobster cheddar bay biscuit. Oh, can I, a quick question. Why do black people love red lobster? <laughs> Jimmy's cousin Sal calls it red Schwarza. I, I, I will say this now. <laughs> Sorry, don't laugh at that, but yeah. why? What's going on? I went to a red lobster. Do you want lobster. me to get historical? Because I got to go deep, like back into the 80s and shit. Yeah, to I want to go. I want to historically know what. Let me first say that black people fuck with Papa Do's and much better seafood establishments now, and red lobster is okay, but it's not what it was. I, the Cheddar Bay biscuits, goddamn. Hold things. on. <laughs> show, show of white people. Has anyone eaten at a Red Lobster? There's two, there, okay, there's a handful of- You people honkies. with your hands All down, right. you're disrespectful. You liars, you know you love Red Lobster. Red Lobster is super expensive and not very good. Here's the thing about Red Lobster though, and this is just, I'm going back to the 80s, the early 90s. Red Lobster, in its heyday, was damn near five-star dining. There was a time, and I'm not even joking. Out of, out of 20 stars? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not where you live, but in Birmingham, Alabama, Red Lobster, you had to call and make reservations. I'm not lying. Like, you legitimately, I'm sorry, it's Red Lobster. You should have called us on Tuesday if you wanted to eat Sunday. You know how we do with the lob? Like, that shit was amazing. It was the pinnacle of good eating. So in the black community, if you're growing up on a fixed income, you don't go out and eat often. So when you do go out and eat, you get dressed up. And every now and then, your parents took you to Red fucking Lobster. So it created this reputation within the black community. And I don't speak for all black people, but I'm just telling you what it was like down south. That Red Lobster was this place to go to a, oh, we're not, we're not even going to the Golden Corral Buffet. Oh, no. What? We're going to right. Red Lobster. So it was seen as this very classy place. My prom night, I took my date to Red Lobster. That's what I'm saying. Which sounds ludicrous now. That's like, oh, we went to Applebee's and got the two for 20. But, but in 1995, my date was happy as hell. All right, what's blacker? All right, hold on. <laughs> I, in, oh, order, in order, of, rank this in order of blackness. Popeye's chicken, Red Lobster, Fuck. or the fat burger that used to be off of La Cienega. I think too many people were shot there and they closed it down, but that fat burger, mm. that fat burger, you gotta put it in order, order of black I put the fat burger third because it's regional. Um, shit, man, Popeye's versus Red Lobster in the black community, that's, that's a fucking Hillary versus Bernie type fucking ass. Yeah. That's a tough one, bro. I don't know which one I would go with. And you don't know, and Fat Burger's not, a, not that's too regional. That's Correct. just out yeah, here. Yeah, but I get what you're saying. The regional burger joint that everybody loves, every region has that. Um, I think historically, Popeyes, if, 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 if you polled black people and asked them if they, could, if they had to eat at only one restaurant the rest of their life, I would pick Popeyes. Right. And then you'd have I, to follow it up and go, but you're only going to live another 14 months <laughs> if yeah. you just eat at Popeye's. Yeah, I'm going to die of malnutrition, but... <laughs> you're 23 now. You'll be dead before 25, yeah. but you'll be happy eating at Popeye's. Yeah, but it's just that what happened with not only Red Lobster, but a lot of these other mid-level dining establishments is that Cheesecake Factory and... 